We are back. Metroid Month is already off to a great start. Many of us already have our hands on Metroid Dread, and yes, I am going to be doing a review about it, but, you know, I need to spend some time with it first. Let's all just bask in the moment and let our thoughts and feelings about that game simmer for a bit, okay? Plus, I am making this review before the game actually comes out, so I do have to be kind of vague about it. Anyway, back to the topic at hand. Metroid Prime hit the scene and knocked it out of the park. Great critical reception, outstanding sales, and Nintendo themselves who is putting Retro Studios in a much better place than it was in before, even stepping in to put an end to that crunch culture that they had going on over there. And with such a resounding success found in the first 3D Metroid game, it was clearly time to get a sequel going. In fact, it seemed like the big end was suddenly feeling confident enough to put a lot more faith in the series as a whole. Not every plan for the series panned out. There was a movie in the works at one point, but that didn't really go anywhere. Check out the video here for more info on that, but there was still effort being put in here. A reimagining of the original game developed for the Game Boy Advance, which we'll be talking about next year, a manga laying out Samus' origins leading up to said game, and of course, a follow-up to the surprise hit that was Metroid Prime. Though while the first game certainly had its creepy moments, it seemed like the sequel would be taking the horror side of Metroid to a whole new level, and we got a good preview of this with the bonus disc that was offered as a reward item for Nintendo.com members and was later packaged with alternate prints of the first game. It had concept art, a trailer, a little timeline guide, and of course, a demo for the game itself. We saw dead, lifeless corridors, a dark and dangerous planet, and some kind of mysterious doppelganger who looked an awful lot like our bounty hunter. It was kind of interesting seeing a new Metroid game building out the engine and the mechanics of the one before it, but what's more interesting is how it still made managed to craft a rather unique identity for itself. You know, before starting Metroid Month last year, there was only one game in the series I had never beaten, and that was this one. So, what are my thoughts on it now that I've actually played through it to completion? Well, spoilers ahead. This is Metroid Prime 2 Echoes. The setting of Echoes is a planet named Aether, where space pirates have been using the location as a base of some kind and routinely moving something to and from it. After a Galactic Federation patrol decides to investigate and doesn't come back, the Federation sends Samus to go fetch their red shirt stand-ins and so off she sets on a new quest. But almost immediately, there's a bit of a twist. While entering the atmosphere of Aether, a storm damages Samus' ship upon landing. We see the ship will need to undergo some repairs before it's ready to take off again. Kinda cool considering in most adventures, Samus stays on planet because she's dedicated to the job, but here, she's stranded. Stepping into the power armor of Samus once again, you can begin searching for the missing Federation troopers. There's already a couple of changes here from the first title, the biggest being the way the scan visor works. In the first game, scannable objects will have a little box floating in front of it when you throw on your scan visor, but here the entire thing is highlighted in a certain color, with red indicating that it's important to advancement. Beyond just how the interface for scanning has improved though, I actually prefer the way this game uses scanning to help flesh out the world a bit more, but we'll get there, we'll get there. As for the rest of the game's controls, everything is going to be about the same as before. I should mention that I'm once again recording this through the Wii version. Given the length of this game, I needed to play through it in the most comfortable way, and frankly, I just prefer the motion controls, much to my own surprise. I mean, the footage here is easier to work with while editing, but when playing the Prime games, this just ultimately feels less clunky to me than the way the camera and arm cannon are controlled on GameCube. That said, I do understand that there's quite a few differences between the Wii and GameCube versions for each game, and maybe I can dedicate that subject matter for its own video later down the line. But as for now, it would just be a bit much to fit all that into a discussion about the game's overall overall structure and design. One element I'm not crazy about for either version though, the menu UI. You've got this center ring with each option springing out from it and you have to rotate around it to find what you're trying to select and it's just weird. I get it, it does look cool, but it feels like a pain to use sometimes, especially when you're trying to flip through the logbook. Like, all I want to do is look back over some of the lore I've picked up around the planet, but the way it's compiled in these menus is nothing short of a headache. General observation is easy as ever though, and oh boy is there a lot to see here. No sign of the Federation soldiers, but they left a lot of crates around. I see some very big and very dead bugs in- Oh. Hey, I found them! I love the eeriness of this opening section. There's a good amount of build-up to finding these poor souls, and you're just left to wonder what resulted in the carnage laid out in front of you. But the questions only start to pile up as those dead soldiers you found start getting up and attacking you, possessed by some kind of dark force. After blasting through the living dread, <laughs> Samus encounters... Well, Samus. Remember when Metroid Prime was defeated in the first game and it absorbed your Phazon suit, and during the secret ending, the suit's hand burst from the creature's remains? Turns out it was actually Metroid Prime using the Phazon suit as a vessel of sorts and mutating into a creepy reflection of our hero who set out on a search for more Phazon in order to grow stronger. This 
is Dark Samus. Well, the OG Samus isn't really all that impressed and follows the entity into a portal, leading to a dark and twisted version of the room they were both just in. She's very quickly overpowered as the atmosphere of this dark realm is damaging to her and she's swarmed by enemies who start absorbing power from her, including many of her weapons and abilities. She narrowly escapes once again and is left with very few of her powers, needing to build herself up once more. While trying to get her bearings, she discovers the patrol ship littered with dead marines and witnesses the last log moments of their lives. They were holding down the fort, but as the spider like splinters started to get possessed by the energy of Dark Aether, the troopers were taken out with little effort. This moment Samus takes to send off this last marine is one of my favorite moments from her. I know Other M was trying to showcase the more gentle or compassionate side of Samus, but it resonates so much better from this one silent shot. Finally, Samus investigates a nearby temple and encounters one of the inhabitants of Aether, a Luminoth known as Yumas. He explains that much like what happened with Talon 4, planet Aether was a paradise up until it was struck with a phazon-infused meteor that rocked the planet to its core, even creating an alternate version of the world known as Dark Aether. Vile creatures known as the Ing began an assault on the Luminoth's version of the world, trying to steal the planet's light, launching both versions of this world into a struggle to obtain that energy. A race to the finish, where the victor's version of the world lives lives on, and the other dies. Yumas enlists Samus' help to locate the Temples of Aether, obtain the light energy from the dark versions, and return it to the light ones. Prime 2 really takes its time getting the ball rolling, but it is a neat setup. It's not all that different from, say, A Link to the Past. But while in A Link to the Past, my issue was that the temples weren't really that fun to me, and I felt like they took away from the overworld exploration, I almost have the opposite problem with this game. The biggest difference here is that the temples themselves aren't very big. Each one is like one big room with a smaller one where the device where the energy is. You're really not spending much time in them. To get inside though, you're gonna need three keys hidden in the Dark Aether version of each main area, stemming off from the central hub that is the temple grounds. You'll need to explore these locations and use portals to hop between the different versions of Aether. You'll collect upgrades, which you should be well used to by now, and use said upgrades to enter new parts of each area. You're gonna recognize most of these, it's mostly just your arsenal from the first game. But one ability that made it over to Echoes from the 2D games is the screw attack, and it's... I mean, it's different. You basically use it to jump in a straight line over large gaps where it works fine most of the time, and you can also use it to wall jump on certain surfaces, which works less often. You'll be jumping between light and dark aether, upgrading yourself with all the items you've come to expect, but also with some new beams and visors like in Prime 1. You can get the dark visor, letting you see otherwise invisible enemies or platforms, though it does share a problem I had with the x-ray visor in the first game. There's really not much telegraphing when this is actually useful, so I'm just constantly swapping visors in every single room just in case, and it felt like I was wasting a lot of time just trying to see if there's anything even worth looking around for. You also get the echo visor, a kind of creative idea where you can see sound ways, which is mostly used for deactivating sensors to open doors. You also get the Dark Suit, which looks pretty cool, but also has the added benefit of reducing how much damage the atmosphere of Dark Aether can do to you. Not much to say about it beyond that, though. Over time, you'll also obtain the Light and Dark Beams, which have an ammo count. Not the end of the world, I guess, but it's still weird. I can only imagine this limit was created because I think you'll be using these more than the other beam types from the first game. I know I did. And once you get the Annihilator Beam, which uses both types of ammo, homes in on enemies, and deals a lot of damage damage, yeah, I think I got way more use out of switching beam types in this game than I did in the first. You know what? I used missiles more too. Props to the combat in Prime 2. It feels so much snappier than before, but also more thoughtful. Enemies had more distinct attack and defense patterns, and I was spending more time thinking about which weapons had a greater effect on what enemies. Encounters didn't feel so mindless, because there was always something to consider when going toe-to-toe -to -toe with an opponent, and that makes enhancing your arsenal all the more satisfying. Like, man, when you get the Seeker missile allowing you to lock onto multiple targets and blast them all at once, I mean, it's good for opening specific doors, but barraging enemies with this is on another level. Weapons just feel good in Metroid Prime 2. On the exploration side of things, though... I gotta be honest, this is not one of my favorite games to play. Actually, it's pretty low on the totem pole. It doesn't help that so many of these areas all look very drab and muted, kind of drained of the life the first game had. At first, I considered that this might have been intentional. I mean, this was a peaceful world, teeming with life until Dark Aether starts sapping all that away, but then you also have to explore Dark Aether. They kind of went for an all-encompassing lifelessness, rather than a contrast that I think would have been more effective. This also hurts the game, because I just don't find a lot of these locations here to be very 
interesting or memorable. There's some to be sure, and I enjoy how a few of these locations are used creatively to hide collectibles like missile expansions and such. But running around through these locations gets old, and even now, writing this script, I barely remember many details about the planet I was just adventuring in. And it's at this point that I feel like I owe Metroid Prime 1 an apology. I complained that I thought that game had way too much backtracking, but... It's got nothing on this. Probably unsurprisingly, Metroid was the first game of its genre I ever played. I didn't get into the series until Super Metroid, but it only took that one game to hook me. Not just in terms of gameplay and design, but even in its lore. At the time, this was assumedly the final Metroid game. We hadn't had one in so many years and the last Metroid was dead. At that point in time, I had been speculating about how they could possibly do another game. We hadn't had a new game in probably six years, and in reality, we still wouldn't see another one for a couple more. I even I remember one time when I was like nine years old uh, calling the Nintendo support line and asking them if there would be another Metroid game, to which the representative echoed my own sentiments to me about the last Metroid being dead. A Nintendo customer service representative crushed my dreams of a Metroid 4. Luckily for us, that was a big fat lie, and we not only got a Metroid 4, but also got a new spin-off series in the form of Metroid Prime. A series like Metroid is so mysterious and eerie, yet alluring in its atmosphere and lore. And just like its in-game progression, it drives you to yearn for more and constantly wonder what more lies ahead. Metroid is a series that is near and dear to my heart, and as much as the sea of games in this genre is vast in current times, I don't think anything truly truly offers what the Metroid series itself does. Safe to say, as long as Samus has more adventures ahead of her, I'll be right there for the ride. When traveling around in a Metroid game, you'll often see things that are blocked off from you that you'll need to return to after collecting certain upgrades. But it drives me crazy how, starting with Torvis Bog, this game will constantly be stopping you dead in your tracks to send you back somewhere you've already been so you can pick up a thing you couldn't get earlier and come back so you can move on a little bit before it repeats the process. This problem is only accentuated when you bring Dark Aether into this because it's just bland, colorless, and annoying versions of places you've already explored. The air itself in Dark Aether can hurt you, so there's a certain level of tension that comes from trying to hop around to all these safe zones so you don't die from just walking around, but the repetition, oh man, the incomprehensible repetition this game is plagued with. No, game, I've already been through Torvis Bog. I want to explore the Sanctuary Fortress. Don't send me back. The mind-numbing back and forth as you just pace over locations you've gone through already feels like padding. It feels like making the very concept of progression a convoluted affair, and I'm sorry I can't come up with more specific examples, but so much of this game just feels like a broken record. Similar looking areas being recycled every 15 minutes because the game can't reach a length quota without sending you running around in circles. And what a length quota it is, I'm pretty sure. Almost positive even that this is the longest game in the series, and oh boy does it feel like it. I think I spent somewhere around like 18 hours, something upwards of that, on this game. That might not sound like a ton compared to some other games, but for a Metroid title, even compared to Metroid Prime 1, that's a lot. And it all blends together, it all meanders, and at this point I'm getting just about as redundant as the game itself. Yeah, I am not a fan of Aether. This planet sucks. It's big, it's boring, and after running through every area like seven times, I can still barely remember any of it. But I wanted to get all of that out of the way now, because while I don't really like the world and structure of this game, there is still so much to love about it. While I'm not crazy about how you move around this place, some of what you can find here is sort of brilliant. The Space Pirates have set up shop here, and there's plenty of log entries to scan, and man, these guys are goofballs when they don't have someone like Mother Brain to keep them in check. These idiots are using dangerous equipment to mess around with each other. They've got Metroids again, but I honestly kind of feel bad for these ones. Their primary purpose here is to be used like living batteries, but there are even some Space Pirates that are trying to keep them as pets. But they're like feeding the poor things treats and food that messes around with their insides, and the little Space Bloods are being kept in pens that are constantly shocking and scarring them. Let's not forget, these are dangerous, but they're not malicious or evil, they're just animals. I probably shouldn't feel so much sympathy for one of the greatest threats to the known universe, but like, 
Look at him, he's hurt. I don't wanna kill him. What's really interesting though is that these guys have been keeping tabs on Dark Samus. They confused her for the real deal at first, but over time started to recognize this creature as something else entirely, even mentioning a possible alliance. We don't see a team up of any sort in this game, but we do see Dark Samus a number of times throughout our adventure. There's this cool buildup where a dark phazon particle effect starts taking over the areas leading up to her encounters, and there's even a couple of places where we see her decimating other enemies and relishing in her victories. The fights with her aren't terribly complicated, but they are engaging, and I like the rivalry that's built up here. Dark Samus is not invincible, but she is a threat, and she grows more powerful with every fight. She's a really cool reflection of the true Samus as well. I mean, we came to this world, scoured its terrain, and searched for power, but all for the sake of saving Aether and the Luminoth who live here. Dark Samus is doing something similar, but she came here to seek power for her own ends, showing what a deadly force Samus Aran could become if she was so self-serving and cold. Still, while her battles aren't the most remarkable, thing in the world, so many of the other boss fights in this game just knock it out of the park. Many of them hold and use Samus' stolen powers, and you'll have to best these abilities to get them back. If that reminds you of another Metroid game, that's good, because I'm gonna call this little trend the fusion principle. My favorite boss is probably Quadraxis. This guy is awesome. You gotta shoot down his legs and wait for his head to detach, then you use the echo visor to interrupt the control signal the main body is sending to it. That's such a cool way to use your abilities, but it doesn't even stop there. Even getting some use out of the spider ball, where you have to latch onto the legs of the main body and rocket yourself into the floating head. It's all such a good use of the player's acquired abilities, and I had such a big dumb smile on my face during this entire battle. And not every boss fight is the best. The spider guardian was kind of a pain, it really just took a while, but I hear it's even worse in the GameCube version. You can mark this as my own feelings as a reviewer for this particular video, but I don't really know what the exact difference is in this fight, but from the sounds of it, that's a couple of points to the Wii release right there. The action was enough to keep me going, and in time, I was able to recover the light energy and return it to all three temples, which means I was finally ready to report back to Yumos and travel to the final area, the Sky Temple, and reclaim its power from the Emperor Ing, the leader of the dark creatures threatening this planet. Wait, Sky Temple? Keys? Wait, you mean like... Oh, come on! Really? After all of that, we're just going back and redoing the artifact hunt? The worst part of Metroid Prime 1? And get this, they made it worse. Sure, in the first game, you could scan the statues at the impact crater and they would give you some kind of helpful hints on how to find the artifacts. And there's something like that here, along with the mercy of only needing to collect nine endgame items rather than 12, but the balance shifts right back to annoying with how they're obtained. Get the clue to the location of a key bearer, try to use this cryptic hint to track said key bearer down, and then keep that place in mind, cause you're gonna have to go find a portal, hop into dark aether, return to the same room, and scour the whole location with the dark visor and find and destroy this stupid creature holding the key. This game is already so much longer than it needs to be, and tacking on a worse version of a stupid fetch quest few people like to begin with isn't just unneeded, it's bad. This was a bad inclusion. I was at least relieved to hear that after knowing where these are, some of them can be obtained early on a second playthrough, but where I said in the first game that you could probably stumble on a few Chozo artifacts on accident just through thorough exploration, the same does not apply here. Especially considering that you get the light suit at this part of the game which means you take no damage from Dark Aether's atmosphere and can tread through pools of some poisonous substance, and yeah, I love this design. It's such a cool look for Samus, and getting to see it helped make me feel a little better about this part, but it also acts as a key to a lock that's keeping these Sky Temple keys scattered all over places you've already been in, again adding to the tedium and redundancy as something you can only obtain here at the end of the game where it damages the pacing the most. The light suit is a cool reward, and the ability to fast travel between temples helps, but they also feel like solutions to problems that didn't need to exist to begin with. Okay, that's enough whining. One once you collect the Sky Temple Keys, you can travel to a sanctuary in Dark Aether and take on the leader of the monsters you've faced, the Emperor Ing. Like the other boss battles in this game, I've gotta sing some praises here. This is a great fight, with several phases that all require you to use your abilities in creative ways. I've been especially impressed by how effective the Prime games have made the Morph Ball in combat scenarios, and the Light and Dark Beams are put to really good use here. Once it's defeated, Samus absorbs the light energy stolen by the monstrosity and... It, hey! Th this is a remix of the escape music from the NES game. Dude, that's kind of awesome. As you sprint out of the area and try to return to Light Aether, however, you're cornered by Dark Samus, who's become grotesque and unstable from all the Phazon she's taken in. One last encounter, one last fight. Take her down before the counter reaches zero, in this moment right here, where Dark Samus is beaten and reaches out to her light counterpart. Is Dark Samus feeling regret? 
remorse? Is she trying to understand what power Samus has used against her, or is she trying to reach out for some glimmer of mercy? I have no idea, and I feel like nobody ever brings up this moment, but I really like it, and I think there's a lot to unpack from this one shot, and I would love to theorize with people about it. No time for that, though. Dark Aether collapses, with Samus just narrowly making her escape. The light suit has faded, no longer needed, and the hibernating Luminoth awaken, offering their gratitude to the bounty hunter who simply walks off into the sun with a silent gesture that her work is done, and she's off to the next adventure. Once again, you get a bonus part of this ending if you collect 75% or more of the items in the game, with Samus showing off her Zero suit before jumping into her ship and, like, I get that this is a staple of the series, but something about this little extra scene feels really awkward to me. Eh, personally, I feel like the ending of this game is just stronger without it. And once again, by collecting 100% of the items in the game, we get one last scene after the credits. But all it shows is a quick shot of Dark Samus rematerializing in the middle of space. Was I a little scatterbrain in this review? Yeah, probably, but there's a lot here, and a lot of it is good. That's the hard part about this review. I like this game. There's stuff about it I love. I mean, the action is some of the best in the series, and I wanted to talk about that, but when the stuff that doesn't work for me revolves around structure, it's hard for that stuff not to come out more. Metroid Prime 2 is... So cool. I love the action, I love the ideas, and some concepts from the first game are fleshed out so well here. Scanning the corpses of Galactic Federation soldiers and Luminoth that died before and reading about their final moments adds a level of dread and horror to the experience I love, but between all of my favorite parts of this game is a world that refuses to be explored in an organic way. I don't regret playing this, not at all, and I would recommend it to more hardcore Metroid fans, but this isn't one that I'll be returning to for quite some time. I'm glad I'm glad the team took the time to experiment, and I'm thrilled with the parts of this game that do work, but I can't say that I fully love Metroid Prime 2 Echoes. You know, there actually was a multiplayer mode to this game too. I mean, it wasn't all that great, it was kind of bare bones to be honest. A couple of players could get together, control Samus, run around arenas with most of your abilities from the main game. You could get points by either uh, shooting each other to death, or shooting each other to pick up tokens. It was, um... Not all that memorable, and I didn't have a whole lot to say about it, but it's not the last game in the series that would have a certain emphasis on multiplayer. So, let's get into that more next time as we take a look at Metroid Prime Hunters. But until then, I hope you're enjoying Metroid Month. Remember that my top tier patrons get to see these videos two days early. You can find me on Twitter, Twitch, Discord, Sunset City, whichever you prefer. Links in the description, and of course, as always, spread the word, tell your friends, and until we see each other again, thank you so much for watching. See you next mission. Hey there, everyone. Thanks for watching. This is Wayne in the past, probably playing Metroid Dread right now. At any given time that you are hearing this, that's probably what I'm up to. I am so excited about this game releasing, and I'm really excited to be doing Metroid Month leading up to its release. But of course, I wouldn't be able to do any of it without my wonderful supporters, including my top tier patrons. This month they are Patricia Marcou, Christine Larkin, Cyrus the Skeptic, Earl Valco, Wonton Photo, Nicholas Morgan, Jeremiah Harrison, and Mr. SP. Man, there are a lot of you. Thank you guys so much. You all make it possible, and you make it worth it. Obviously, with all of this Metroid content that's gonna be coming out this month, I still have a lot of work to do, and I have a lot of dread to play, so thank you guys once again for joining me, and I will see you next time. Alright, peace.